What's up, Game Devs? T Chan here, and welcome to episode 33 of Game Dev Loadout, where I chat with today's most experienced game developers seven days a week. We will learn about their backgrounds, the challenges they face, and the tools they use to reach success. And today's future guest is Benjamin Stokes. Benjamin, it is go time. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yes, he is a civic media scholar and a game designer at American University. Previously, he co-founded Games for Change, which is the movement hub for advancing social change with games. He was also the program manager at Mark Arthur Foundation, which launched a learning initiative to help determine how digital technologies are changing the way young people act. So go ahead, Benjamin, give us a bit about your personal life and how you got started in the game industry. Well, I've always uh, loved playing games, um, but for me, uh, play is also something I do in other areas of my life. Uh, when I am engaged in civic life, when I'm volunteering, I'm always looking for a fun twist on things. Uh, but I'm, I'm a systems guy too. And so as a kid, I did a lot of programming and I kept thinking about games as systems, as feedback loops, as ways of giving people a little bit of guidance about what they can do next to improve. Um, and so uh, I, I got increasingly into making games that also were part of how we do real world life. So whether you think of it as gamification, uh, and that's not a term that I that I use a lot, but it's a term a lot of people know. Um, game full is one people use as well. I do a lot of my games that are in the real world uh, and tie into how people take action and engage with the rest of their life. Interesting. So what do you consider your main area of expertise when it comes to uh, games? I would say that I'm a civic media game designer. Uh, so my main area of expertise is how games might connect to how people can contribute to civic life. So by virtue of playing games, they also make a difference in the world. And what is something we, we game devs probably don't know about that type of subject that we should know about? Well, the first thing that I think a lot of game devs might not realize is that games have been made uh, by people in uh, movements for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, of course, uh, games are how people uh, do, do icebreakers in companies, but they're also how people meet each other on the streets. They're how people pass the time. And so the idea of designing games around things like activist causes has been around uh, in all sorts of different countries and cultures. So that's the first thing is history. And second, uh, I think that the future of a lot of where games are going and some of the limits of games is also uh, a great place to, to look is uh, where civic games Games are, and especially games that tie into the real world. So things like our phone systems, how we connect to government, uh, a lot of the stuff around augmented reality, uh, I think, is most interesting with mixed reality. And so it's not necessarily about the graphics, but it's about where we put the game. And so I think that the idea that using things like uh, ordinary tools for contacting government as part of your game design process can stretch your brain as a game designer uh, in a really interesting way. Well, and so you think AR is the next big uh, social change when it comes to gaming? Yeah, I think AR, I would say uh, AR or mixed reality uh, is, is just kind of the future of where computing is going because the physical world and the digital world are increasingly intersecting. So I think it's not going to necessarily be like a next big thing, like it's going to come and then, and then it's going to fade back away. Uh, Pokemon Go certainly did that. But I think that what we're going to see instead is a, a, a slow burn, a gradual rise, and more and more parts of our lives are going to be partly digital and can be partly playful. I mean, think, of, for instance, about the smart home. Uh, those smart thermostats aren't going anywhere. Think about your smart car. Uh, that's not going anywhere. And increasingly, this is also how our government is going to work. So I think that th that's all mixed reality. You know, if it's part of your car, if it's part of your house. Uh, and, and that's also part of mixed reality, augmented reality. So I do think it is it is kind of a future, and it's a really interesting one for game design. Definitely. And if people had to teach themselves to learn about these social games or, like you say, civic games, uh, what do you, do you suggest they try to use to learn about those things or to teach themselves? Definitely. Uh, I would recommend play out with something that goes cross-platform because the first thing that so many g people – do when they are picking uh, a style of game is they pick an engine and they pick one platform. They decide, is it going to be for mobile or is it going to be for desktop? Very rarely, unless you have a whole bunch of money, do you even think about whether we're going to make the same game for multiple platforms. But I would say multiple misses the point even. In some ways, like a lot of the stuff that's mixed reality is more about trans-platform, crossing-platform how platforms connect to each other. So something that starts with an interaction on your mobile phone, how is it something you pick up at your computer? How is it something that calls you? 
back on your phone? How is it something you text back a picture? So I think those kind of systems that cross platforms are, are really great ways for game devs to start playing around with this, this space. And what are common mistakes even at a pro level that people make? Well, I, I would say that the one of the biggest mistakes uh, is giving in to the tendency to think about uh, civic engagement as something that should be purely functional uh, and should be easy. So uh, some of the games that are out there, it's all about doing more. So more is better. The more things you report, the more points you get. Uh, I think that, that one of the things that we should remember as game devs is that great games are about appropriate levels of challenge and difficulty. And so I think one of the exciting things uh, about the future of civic games is that we can think about matching how hard the, the game is, how, how interesting the civic act is uh, into the game system. So the game helps us maintain a, an appropriate level of difficulty with our civic actions. Um, that's something that, that we can forget sometimes because the people making a lot of civic tools want them to be easy. Uh, they want voting to be easy. And I think that that's great. Voting probably should be easy, but a game that's about voting and engagement should have an appropriate level of challenge. So that's kind of a, a conceptual hint. And how do you determine that challenge? Is, is it by user experience only or is there other ways of determining that? Yeah, I think, well, always user experience and feedback from users is the best thing. But I think we can also think about it structurally. So, for example, one of the things that I think civic life is about is about getting people together, getting groups of people together. So mechanics that reward larger groups, that's a way in which you can build in cha a challenge quite naturally, because it's pretty easy for me to call up one of my friends and get them to answer their phone. It's very hard for me to get a conference call going with 10 of my friends. <laughs> but imagine, but imagine that that's actually part of how you get points in the game, that it requires a conference call line with regular phones where everyone has to be in the phone and on their phone and they have to say something in order for the system to like kick over and give you the points. So I think that that's an unnatural inherent challenge that's just about the scarcity of time. So here's a hint for game developers. Think about scarcities that are there in, in the physical world or in the social world, because scarcities are a great place where you can build in natural challenge, where people have scarcities of time, uh, scarcities of money, scarcities of, of voice. So for instance, how many causes can you put your voice to? Uh, probably only a couple. How many times can you get your name in the paper with a letter to the editor? Probably only a couple. So you can't do it again and again, which means when it's scarce, it's really hard to convince somebody to do something because it, it, there's going to be a big trade-off. So I think looking for scarcities uh, is a, is another great tip. Overall, what do you think are the key principles for making sure like the social game are, is really interactive, it gets people hooked, and it gets a lot of people hooked at the same time? What, what are your key principles o over that? Well, to, to be honest, I think that the, the commercial model of we got to get a lot of people hooked isn't necessarily the right one when you're thinking about civic games. Mm. Uh, in, instead, the goal might be more about uh, does it do the kind of right things for that place? So I think about civic games in a local, in an augmented reality sense as being almost more like neighborhood parks. Like the goal of my neighborhood park is not to get a thousand people there because that ruins the park. <laughs> I don't want a thousand people at my park, right? So that, that mindset is totally missing to people, especially people coming out of like San Francisco, uh, Silicon Valley kind of app development. Because in the app world, it's all about scale. You, the thing you really want is getting a million people, 10 million people, a hundred million people. That's success. But, but I think that flipping that a little on its head and saying, no, no, it's not about scaling the thing many, many times. It might just be about the quality of the experience. This is a little of what I think of as almost the small games movement, uh, celebrating games that are deliberately about your personal experience um, and not necessarily about the app that draws everyone in. Now, it still has to be about quality, still has to keep people totally engaged, but it might be engaged on their, for the reasons that they're there. So if what they really want out of an experience is, is to meet some new people in their neighborhood, great, give them that. But there are some people that that's just not what they're looking for in their neighborhood. They instead may be looking for good city services or get out and, and, and walk a little bit, experience the, the fresh air. Um, so whatever it is, matching it to what people people are doing in your place. Uh, and, and I think that the best indicator for that is, is whether you actually talk to people and they love it. Second indicator is talking to groups that are already doing that kind of organizing and seeing if you can extend it. That's something that happens a lot in civic work. There's usually already somebody working on your issue. Just follow along with them and see if your game can't amplify what they're already trying to organize. Oh, all those value bombs. That is a great advice. Go check out, get that user experience and or get someone that's on the same page as you and see if you can amplify your game. Yeah. 
Uh, now let, let's take this to a more personal level because you know creating a game can be very long and difficult and i'm pretty sure you have some bad moments like what is the worst moment of your career like that one moment that is still vivid in your mind be very detailed and give us that story <laughs> worst moment of my career well i'll have to think more about what it is i'm sure there have been some some bad ones let me think about in terms of game design in particular i i think that there's the, the biggest things i actually uh, always think about are, are the, the moments right when something's about to launch and there's always that irrational fear that nobody's going to come and everyone's going to hate it and i have to be <laughs> honest like that's never happened. Uh, some, every time when, when I when I get my games going, there's always some people there who come and play it. And and I have to say that for me, that's some of the satisfaction is uh, even just having one person really in, engage with the experience in some way kind of relieves that stress. So I think that that moment right before launch is can be a, a pretty intense one. Um, I do think that uh, there are some moments where you, you get really excited about something and, and things don't quite come through after a lot of work. So failure is something that I think happens in every game development uh, project. And for me, one of the big ones, we I did a big fundraising project for a game uh, in New York, probably a decade ago, and we, and we really needed about five hundred thousand in order to to launch this game. Definitely the biggest game I've ever fundraised for, and we got probably like halfway there. That was a really exciting uh, initial moment, but then there was a point where we realized it just wasn't going to get to the next phase. And so I think that was a kind of failure, almost on the executive producing side. Um, and I was out there trying with other people. We had a whole big team. Uh, I was one of several people that were hitting the street trying to, to raise money for this. I think that was a pretty disappointing thing because we poured a ton of work and, in fact, hired other game developers to help us think through this idea. Um, Eric Zimmerman uh, in, in New York uh, with Game Lab at the time helped us flesh out what, what the game could be. Uh, so working with a bunch of different great partners, collaborators, game designers, uh, and then not to have it actually come to fruition, that was another uh, a kind of disappointing thing. So th these, these, though, I think are, are learning moments for everybody. Uh, and, we, and you just have to think, well, should we have scaled it differently in the beginning? Uh, or maybe we did the right thing, and that's just where, where, where how the world turned out. That's the fate of the universe. Yes, and not take that failure too personally. It happens, you learn from it, and you move on. Uh, you know, you do something different the next time. And also, you're right about the fear about launching the game before. Like, sometimes the fear we think about just never, ever happens. And so when you think about that fear, sometimes it's just like it's a waste of uh, energy, or mind energy thinking about that. So you just got to go do it and see what happens. And what, what do you want to make sure game devs take away from these experience about the fear and about the, the failure that, that happened? Well, I, I think that the biggest lesson is uh, don't go it alone. Uh, there is still sometimes a mentality in, uh, uh, and, an, and even a celebration in the game dev community, especially the indie community of just make it on your own and see how it works. But I think that some of the, the failure story I was just telling about trying to raise money with other people, I think is a risk that we have to keep trying to take, try to make games with other people. And not just like if you're not just with a graphic designer, if you don't have graphic design skills, but especially as we're thinking about civic and augmented reality games that are for communities, it means making them with organizations. Now, organizations are a pain to deal with. They take so much effort. Uh, they're really exhausting. Uh, you have to spend a lot of time just going there, even to things that don't deal with the project, just to show support, to show interest, to build trust. Uh, and I think that that kind of participatory process uh, is something that that I think takes patience, but is worth the payoff. So keep focused on on that as 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 something that is just how you have to make the game. In the same way, you you have to have the skills for coding. You have to have the trust with the community partners. So I, I think that's something that uh, I, I go back to a lot. Yeah, no one succeeds alone. No one. Um, what is the best investment you've made? And it could be an investment of money, time, or energy. And how did you decide to make that investment? Gosh, uh, I, I think that uh, there are a million small investments, and it probably varies by project. Um, I think that uh, one that I've really uh, been been pleased with over the long term is just to keep experimenting with with funny technologies that are exciting to me. Uh, that's an investment that nobody's telling me I have to do. And in fact, there are usually people saying, well, you know, do the things for this project or do the research that you have to do in order to build this game um, or this civic media uh, service. But, but I think that from my perspective, uh, some of the best things that I've, I've gained are when I've invested time just because something seems fun to play with. And I think this is a little bit of like the tinkerer's mentality 
uh, the artist's mentality, follow a little of your of your whim. I did this with a tool um, called Open VBX uh, that is a great platform for doing some prototyping with uh, phone systems. So MMS, SMS, um, voice lines, it lets you do really fast um, prototyping without even programming at all. It's can be, you can do it just visually, and then you can start adding in code. You can start adding in PHP. Um, you, you can get all into uh, building the database just how you want it, but it's a great kind of early tool. That's, that is a tool that has opened up a whole bunch of different uh, design projects for me, and, and I learned it just because I invested that time kind of when I didn't have it. Uh, so, so I think the, the investment that you're not expected to make is almost uh, one that I'm more proud of, uh, especially when it pays off across multiple projects. Say that too one more time. So it's called Open VBX, uh, and uh, it's uh, based. It, it, it is an open source platform that runs on top of the service Twilio, and uh, Twilio is a great kind of cloud telephony product that's out there. Uh, if you want to do something like run a call center, um, if you want to, if you're the next Uber and you want to figure out how you're going to keep all those drivers dispatched and <laughs> and let them t- send texts and receive calls without exposing what their number is, uh, with you paying for the minutes, uh, with kind of doing the coordination and tracking, notifying people when they're there. These are the kind of, uh, of kind of cloud telephony services that people use. That's an example of something that to me is, is part of the future of the internet of things and augmented reality. No, but people don't think of it as a game development platform. So that, that's exactly why I think that uh, it, it's uh, exciting and rewarding when those things pay off and they turn out to be a core part of a game engine. Uh, it's a game engine that you might build or, or envision. Uh, and I think that that's a, a, one, of the, one of the kind of tools that I'd recommend. Open VBX. Open VBX. I would definitely link that up. Now, uh, what is the one thing you're most excited about today in the game industry? Uh, the, I'm, I'm really excited about just the continuing broadening of what games can be. Um, and, and I mean that both in a technology sense, but even more in a sense of the public imagination. Uh, so f- I, one of the crazy things that, that I, uh, I talk with people about is how Pokemon Go has opened the public imagination to what games can be. Not because Pokemon Go is a great game. Although, you know, my sister is obsessed with it. She still <laughs> plays it. Um, you know, m- most people have moved on from Pokemon Go. Uh, but but there are still, uh, there's this memory of what that experience was mm-hmm. uh, that I think is now available. We can tap into that and, and open people's eyes to what games in cities, on streets, between neighbors, where you're meeting somebody uh, at a local park uh, or a monument. I think this is a really exciting thing uh, for uh, thinking about augmented reality uh, and place-based games. So uh, that's an example that I think is just in that one particular space, but there are more and more games that are going in different directions all the time. Games that are thinking about how we tap into how the brain works and brain waves as ways of controlling the interface. Um, the, the whole movement around things like different games and thinking about d- really diverse audiences, uh, different populations trying to tell their story, um, people using games as expressive media, uh, even when they are not uh, programmers. So I, I think it's really the explosion the, in breadth of what games can be in the public imagination that I think most excites me right now. Yeah, and I think Pokemon Go, to me, is still crazy of what kind of influence it had on people because everybody, all type of age groups, is just going out there looking for Pokemons. And even strangers were talking to each other saying, hey, the Pokemon's over here. Hey, Pokemon's over here. Like, it it really changed a lot uh in Houston, when I saw in Houston, people just went to the park together and just looked for Pokemon. It's, it was incredible. Yeah, it's really a phenomenon. Um, and, and I think that it's these experiences that are uh, like Pokemon Go that I think a lot of hardcore gamers would, would kind of turn up their nose at it. Uh, a lot of game designers, you know, is this the kind of game you really want to make? On the other hand, the scale is pretty exciting. The scale of what the cultural engagement is exciting. And and I think that uh, when we think about games in physical space, that's pretty exciting as well. I've been doing some work uh, lately, doing some interviews uh, with different people uh, who have been using Pokemon for different things. And there's ways in which lots of communities are starting to think about, oh, I maybe I could use Pokemon uh, for some project I have. You know, can I use it in a bookstore to have an event, bring people together and have a discussion about 
books, but also how, how should our community change? There's a group in Boston that's doing a project right now called Participatory Pokemon, oh, where they're yeah. thinking about whether there are areas that uh, don't have as many Pokestops. And what do you know? Those areas are, are areas that have less investment from the city, fewer monuments in general. Uh, there might even be correlated with, with lines of class and race. So they're doing a whole like asking, just like we have, we talk about food deserts. They're saying, are, are there pokey deserts? Are there areas that we can contribute? <laughs> And they're organizing young people to go and to add, try and add in some spots, nominate. What, what spot should we add? Should we add a new Pokestop? So I, I think that there's, uh, yeah, there is still a lot of energy uh, from that game. And I'll be curious to see where that goes. Yeah, I absolutely love it. That is awesome. Um, don't forget Game Devs. You can check out GameDevLoadout.com for all the show notes. And you can also subscribe to my email list to get tips and updates. And now we have reached a crunch time that phase that Game Devs dread. But we are here to overcome it. Basically, Benjamin, I would ask quick questions and you'll be giving us a ton of valuable information in return. Are you ready to crush it and release this show? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, what was holding you back from becoming a game developer? Uh, probably just the uh, willingness to try it. Uh, I wasn't sure it would be me. Uh, so give it a try. Give it a try. Yes. Uh, what's a personal habit that contributes to your success? Uh, being willing to experiment and tinker and always be learning. Got to learn new languages. Got to learn new libraries. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? <laughs> uh, pick the job where you'll learn, not necessarily the job where you get paid the most. Oh, I love that. That's actually a really good one. Um, how has a failure set you up for later success? Uh, I think failures with fundraising in particular uh, help you realize you got to get a lot of people lined up to, to get the money for a project uh, and support and how you build people teams for that. Uh, I think is something that I'm I'm still learning from. So that's a good one. Uh, aside from that one about the fundraising one, do you have like another favorite failure that you could think of? Another favorite failure. Um, I think that uh, the, the question of um, how we can deal with legal constraints is a, is a failure that um, a, a lot of us have encountered and never gotten past. So there's a failure that we're still, uh, we're still encountering uh, young people when they, when they move online have a lot less freedom in some ways in terms of how we can collect information on them, how they can use credit cards. So I think trying to offer games that give young people ways to um, take action online, uh, especially preteens has been an ongoing failure of the whole sector. Mm, wow. Uh, go ahead and share an internet resource we game devs should use. Um, internet resource. Uh, I, I think that uh, ironically, I would keep pushing people back to, to things that are not internet, that are things like cards. Uh, so physical cards, brainstorming cards, uh, use physical space, use paper prototypes for mm. things like uh, augmented reality games. And there are some things you can order online uh, and, and then bring them back into the physical world. Uh, Mary Flanagan makes some uh, fantastic cards for for brainstorming uh, games. There's, uh, there's also some in really interesting augmented reality cards uh, that, that have been, uh, that have come out for brainstorming augmented reality ideas. So build your card decks for making game ideas. Yeah. Something about the physical and tangible of an object just makes it more influence or stronger. Cause I, I write in my journal, my book every single day. Like, I don't use a computer. Like I write in a physical book every single day to write down my goals. And it, to me, it just feels more powerful that way. Yeah. I think there's a way in which the, the tangibleness of that and knowing that if you're going to go back and erase things, it's much or cross things out. There's a way in which that that lasts. You you have to confront that on the page. So yeah, the physical has some pretty amazing properties. Um, now this next question is a bit of a doozy, so take your time if you need to. Uh, imagine you woke up the next morning in a brand new world and you knew no one. You still have all the experience and knowledge you currently have today. Your food and shelter is taken care of, and you have a laptop. What would you do step by step on the path to become a great game developer? I feel like my game development process is very responsive to what organizations need or neighborhoods need. So the first thing I would say is I got to like actually close the computer and listen. Try Ooh, to listen yeah. to what people are doing, listen to what's going on in the neighborhood, and especially listen to like pain points, like where are people frustrated uh, or where do they seem bored and disengaged. So I think that uh, that's the that's the starting point before I get into, into coding. Sometimes the way that I listen really carefully is actually what you were talking about with journaling. Uh, so write and reflect. Start with that reflection process. And you're right. You, you're going out to the public to get their feedback or their response. And you just market and create a game for that. So you're basically going to create something and give them what they want. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, 
Thank, we reached the end. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, give a, go ahead and give us a party piece of guidance in how we can connect with you. Uh, well, I would love to see anybody stopping by the uh, new game lab space that we're opening up. American University is just opening up a new game building facility here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I teach in, the, in our game design program there. And anybody that's looking for a, uh, ma- whether it's a master's degree in game design, we also offer certificate programs. Um, we'd love to show you our space and think about how games and play can connect to what things that uh, government's doing in D.C., think tanks, whatever. So we have a great space. Come to D.C. Come to D.C. and check him out. Uh, go ahead and give a parting piece of guidance. Um, parting piece of guidance. Uh, keep experimenting. Uh, there are so many kinds of games that we haven't even discovered or invented yet. Uh, and mm. I think that they're going to be made by the people who are listening to this call and are trying new crazy things with games. So uh, keep experimenting. Yes, keep experimenting. Game still is booming. It's to have a lot to do. Benjamin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. And for that, we are truly grateful. Uh, we look forward to your future work. And until then, we will catch you next time. Been great talking with you. Thank you, Game Does, for listening. And remember that knowledge is only potential power. Execution is the game. I'm so excited to announce that I am doing a giveaway sponsored by Game Dev Underground, a marketing and connection platform for indie developers that helps you build, finish, and launch better games. The winner gets a one-hour consultation with the founder, Tim Ruswick, which he was a guest on episode four. This is over $1,000 in value, and it could be yours. All you have to do is rate and review the podcast that's it check out my show notes for more details and until then keep on making games and i will catch you on the next episode bye